thank you, and I appreciate that. Um, we're all suffering just a little bit from the tyranny that is uh, Dr. Mitchell here and shortening our talks to a mere 15 minutes. So I thought that I might as well comment about that. Um, I decided it would be better if I just put the, the, the bottom line right up front. It's a better outlook this year for dairy with a couple of asterisks. You know, and the asterisks, of course, mean redefine print. I'm going to start out with one of those. Tessa did a nice job of talking about the economy, but, you know, I'm not sure that we got all of the gravitas to do. And if I count the general economy, one of the things that's kind of important, is, or at least has been historically important in looking at where is the economy going, is this look between a 10-year and a 2-year Treasury bill rate. Uh, that simple difference has correctly forecast over the last 50 years all seven of the recessions that we've had. And there was one false positive in that time period, which was just slower growth as opposed to actual recession. And I point that out because at this point in time, we're at a level where a recession would seem to be um, perhaps on the horizon. I don't think this is going to happen in 2020, so I'm not so worried about it today. I also think that since this is a, an election year, that, you know, there's much that can be done to kind of stave this off, and nobody wants to be looking at a major downturn um, in an election year. So I think that Washington will tug on as many strings as they have available to them to make sure this doesn't happen. But by the time we look at the end of the year and maybe on into uh, 2021, um, it's possible. So a recession is one of those aspects that um, I have to at least look at because that's not been good for uh, dairy economy in the past as we see quite a bit of moderation in sales of dairy products. But let's take a look at our dairy industry. Number of dairy cows. Um, in the early part of the downturn over the last five years that we've had in milk prices, we didn't see a downturn in dairy cow numbers uh, for quite a period of time. And in point of fact, if you look at this graph, um, 2015, 16, and 17, um, the uh, green and yellow lines shown here all show the increasing number of dairy cows. It really wasn't until we got into 2018 that we began to see uh, this is taking enough of a bite on the industry that we began to lose cow numbers. So our growth in milk production was at least contracting over that time period. And this past year in 2019, um, the cow number losses stabilized a bit, thin down some, and up just a little bit. But um, we are not seeing rapid growth in dairy cow numbers, nor do I expect that to happen over this next year. Some of the loss in dairy cow numbers that we've had and, and moderation in milk production growth has shown up also in stocks of cheese. Um, cheese stocks are important to watch and take a look at because uh, they do provide us an opportunity to consider where we think those prices are likely to be going. When stocks begin to get burdensome, as they've been in the prior couple of years, um, we find that uh, there's downward pressure on those prices to clear the markets of the excess product that we've had. I put that little thought bubble over there because over the course of 2019, we have seen the stocks of uh, American cheese and some other products working their ways down. Um, those um, tightening of stocks are hardly tight at this point in time, but they're at a more comfortable place. And I think that's allowed some buoyancy in cheese prices that we've seen over the latter half of 2019 and allowed our class three prices to increase. It's been a little different, though, when you look at butter stocks. Now, here, um, this is showing a very typical seasonal pattern for us. Actually, we have a pattern that's shaped similar to this normally in the cheese industry, which you didn't see on the previous chart. That is that we have growth during the flush season of the year in stocks as we build inventories for the larger demand season in the fall. And while the scale of this graph doesn't make it apparent, that red line out there clear to the right-hand side of uh, 2019 butter stocks is showing you that those have been growing a little bit. And some of the growth that we've seen there has been a result of imports of butter into this country, um, not a loss of uh, appetite for butter in the, in, the, uh, in the U.S. 
And we, we always have to think a little bit about our opportunities for um, export sales and occasionally for import products. When you take a look at butter prices, this chart is showing you um, the uh, Oceana butter prices, that's Australia and New Zealand in green, the European Union butter prices in blue, all on U.S. dollars per pound, and the U.S. prices in red. Now, it may not look like a big difference, but out there in the uh, 2018, latter half of 2018 and 2019, you'll see that we had a divergence in U.S. butter prices as compared to the other world exporters. That can happen for short periods of time, but if it happens long enough and appears to be sustained enough, then we don't become a competitor for world butter sales. We become a customer. And that did happen uh, this last year. We imported quite a bit more butter. And hence, our butter prices are being driven back together again. This doesn't have uh, the latest data that we have available, or at least uh, looking at the other stock numbers, but we are seeing um, butter prices come up on world markets as well as U.S. prices come down. We have convergence. I think that those imports of uh, butter are going to stop and that we have room for the prices to be running together again. If you look at cheese prices, um, you can see out here that uh, there is divergence again in cheese prices in the U.S. The red line clear out at the right-hand side as compared with Oceana benchmark prices. And that, I think, has also uh, reined us in a little bit as to what our enthusiasm can be. It's not that we export a lot of cheese, but we do export some. And uh, those prices cannot diverge very far before uh, we're going to be pulled back into this uh, relationship with world prices. But here's one of the better pieces of news. This is taking a look at the change in milk production um, in the global market uh, for the major exporters. So that dashed black line is the percent change in milk production for all major global exporters. That includes the U.S., but it also includes the European Union and uh, Oceania as well as Argentina. And the red line is showing you the change in milk production for the U.S. You'll note that since 2017, all of this, including U.S., has been on a downward trend. Our milk production growth has been negative in some months, and it is um, at the point of pretty slow growth right now. So we haven't had to rely on increased exports as much because our growth in milk production has slowed. This has allowed not only U.S. stocks to begin to reduce and clear the market, it's also allowed international stocks to reduce. And I believe there's a place for the markets to feel just a bit tighter. One of the elephants in the room uh, is going to cause me to shift my discussion just a little bit, and that's on demand for dairy products. This is a chart that's looking at the demand for fluid milk or the sales of fluid milk. And you'll notice that on a total sales basis, this is not per capita basis, there's a little bit of up and down until we get to about the year 2010. And at that point in time, you'll notice a pretty substantial erosion of fluid milk sales. Uh, this continues to this day. I'm not sure that I can enumerate all of the reasons, but we've seen casualties from uh, this kind of trend as well. We've had pretty prominent headlines um, in this uh, early part of the year uh, for a couple of bankruptcies uh, in the fluid milk sector that have been large. So I thought I would give you just a couple of fluid thoughts. Um, this looks like a segment of the industry that's not doing well, uh, the dairy supply chain, and indeed it is having some problems. Uh, one of the issues that the beverage industry has is that this is a company, or a, a group of companies, a, a sector segment, where the margins are very thin, very thin. There's just not a lot of profit in putting milk into a bottle, and when you're uh, in that kind of an industry with declining consumption, it makes it difficult to be showing profit. Now, there are some other things that we're fighting against as well. Um, we've been showing the declining sales out there due to uh, a lot of attribution to plant-based beverages, but it's more than that. Um, probably a more uh, potent competitor uh, to fluid milk has actually been bottled water. 
So uh, competition in the beverage space has been uh, fierce for fluid milk. We've also been facing demographic headwinds. Uh, our changing population is getting older. We're having fewer children, and children are major consumers of beverage milk or fluid milk. So that's created some problems for us as well. And then finally, we have just changing preferences for uh, the way we eat and consume things. I'm part of that problem. Um, when I was younger, my mother would have put maybe two or three boxes of cold cereal on the table in the morning, and that was breakfast. I'd get to choose between them, but there was going to be milk on anything. So, um, you know, that was part of breakfast. I haven't had cold cereal in a long time. But I do go to the refrigerator, and I open it up, and there's a carton of yogurt that I'll pull out and have that for breakfast. I've changed my preferences. I'm consuming uh, my dairy now by eating it rather than drinking it. And I think that what I would say is that this, that we've, headlines we've seen in the fluid milk industry does not reflect the overall health of the dairy industry itself. In fact, it's not all bad news. If we take a look at um, these categories, um, we have American style cheeses on the bottom. The next category up are other style cheeses, which include um, Italian style. And we have yogurt sales and butter. All of those have been growth categories for the dairy industry. In fact, on a per capita basis, um, milk equivalent for all dairy products, uh, we saw the largest per capita consumption of dairy products in the U.S. since the mid-60s this last year. We have been increasing sales. So here are my price forecasts. I've got three sets of prices up there. Um, in the blue are class three prices. The red line are class four prices. And the green is the U.S. all milk price. The dash portion of it is in my forecast for those different uh, uh, segments. You'll notice that we've got a downturn over the next couple of months in prices, and that's largely because uh, we've got adequate stocks. We have commitments fully from our big demand season, which is Thanksgiving through Super Bowl. I'm sorry that the Packers aren't there, but uh, they probably would have impacted cheese consumption. Uh, but nevertheless, as long as we've got our commitments, we don't need to worry about purchasing um, stores of dairy products uh, on a short-term basis if our stocks look adequate. Let's just sit back and see what's going to happen to prices. Buyers can readily get products that they want and need. So I think of what we have are markets that are looking for a next big piece of news. Now, a major contributing outlook factor to my uh, outlook um, includes positively a slowing U.S. and world milk production, a declining U.S. and world dairy stocks, a relatively strong domestic economy here in the U.S., and trade improvements. On the negative side, we've got prolonged trade negotiations. Uh, we've got slowing GDP growth in some countries like China, and we've got uh, economies, major economies that are close to recession. Germany, France, UK, and Italy come to mind. And there's a possibility then that I tossed out in the beginning of the U.S. sliding toward recession. Um, if that happens, we're concerned. And then I put finally down here this coronavirus. And, you know, one of the reasons I look at that is that uh, I think we've seen some impact from that already on dairy markets yesterday, and I'll just show you a little bit more about that in a second. So my forecast is watch the flush. If I had anything to indicate to folks that's going to be the next big piece of information that the market wants to see. If it's a big flush this spring, a lot of milk production out there, and by that I mean maybe 620 million pounds of milk per day um, during April, May, possibly June, then that indicates we've got plenty of product and prices are going to grow more slowly. If it's a light flush, 615 million pounds or less, then I think we've got room for stronger growth in milk prices. Personally, that's where I am. So I'm going to say watch the flush out there. That's the neutral um, production level there in the gray bar. Um, heavy flush would be above that. This shows seasonal pattern and why they call it the flush. I'm projecting that the 2019 all milk price will be up about $2.36 by the time we get our uh, final report here at the end of the year. And I think it will continue to uh, climb absent another recession in 2020, maybe another dollar twenty a hundred weight. 
in my opinion, and futures markets don't suggest this yet, but I think we could hit $20 milk again uh, next year, particularly toward the end of it, because I do think that production is likely to be lighter, not only because of cows, but milk production for cows. We've had a fundamental structural change in the industry out here. It's going to be a little while coming up, but I think that the impact will be almost as great as it was in the 1980s. And the farm loss that we've seen is not done just because we've got prices that feel like they're recovered. Um, I think this will have a long tail, maybe take another couple years before we fall back into equilibrium. And then finally, I threw this chart in just this morning. I had to say, thunk, you know? That's the sound of the coronavirus hitting the market. If you take a look at our red line up there, the Class 3 futures price, they fell more than 70 cents in many nearby months yesterday. And, you know, this is unwrapping rapidly, but when the world's largest importer or buyer of dairy products um, is beginning to isolate and cocoon themselves, there's a lot of people that are concerned about market impacts of that, I think, all the way through uh, to our dairy industry. And with that, I thank you.